This evening we're continuing Psalm 119 and we're going to be looking at verses 97 through 104. By the way, <clears throat> this is not only the longest psalm, it's also the longest chapter <laughs> in, uh, in the Bible. Uh, so it's taking us a little while to get through it, but I hope you're not finding it to be tedious, but rather a blessing. It actually has 176 verses. And again, as we think about uh, the way that um, many churches view the law of God today, you really can't read this psalm and come away with the idea that the psalmist looked at this in any other way than as a blessing. And we certainly see that in our text this evening, Psalm 119, beginning in verse 97. The psalmist writes, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have observed your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From your precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. It's interesting how it opens and closes, isn't it? I love your law. I hate every false way. Uh, that, by the way, is exactly the way our Lord Jesus Christ was. And if you know him, that is how it will be with you as well. Not perfectly, but that will be your heart, your desire, and you'll be continuing to grow in that love. Now this evening, obviously, we're looking at the psalmist's love for God's law, and we're looking at why he loved it. Now, it shouldn't surprise us by this time that the psalmist did love God's law. He's been telling us that really through the entire psalm. Uh, and, of course, why he loves it. For instance, uh, two weeks ago, uh, he told us what we've already been reviewing this evening. And that is that obedience brings blessing. But you really don't know what obedience is until you see what God's law actually says. God does not give give his blessings to the disobedient, to those who disobey him. And, even, and sometimes he even withholds it from those who are obeying him in order to teach us important lessons. But we do know from Scripture he most often blesses those who will honor him first, which is why Jesus tells us, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. All the things that you need for life and godliness. Is there anything you need? Any blessing that you're not receiving? Make sure, first of all, that you are doing what God tells you to do. Now, last week, we also saw that even though this is true, that we have to obey to receive the blessings, we also saw that, that our obedience doesn't have to be perfect. And we need to be thankful for that because we're incapable of perfect obedience. Uh, the Bible tells us what we know very well to be the case from our own experience that there's still a lot of sin in our heart, a lot of imperfection, which means we cannot do God's will the way we would like to do it, which should be the way Jesus did. Uh, we can't do it. You know, it's funny that um, I, I mentioned this before. I, I used to think when I first became a Christian that living like Jesus would be an easy thing. It's just a matter of making a choice and doing it. But it's not quite so easy, is it? And as you walk with the Lord over a period of time, you see, as you understand what perfection is, you see more and more that you just cannot reach it, which is why you need Jesus Christ. Don't forget what the Apostle Paul said toward the end of his life when he called himself the chief of sinners. You know, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Not I was, and I've come a long ways from that, but I am because as he grew in the Lord, he saw more of what perfection was, and he realized how much more he fell short of it. 
we cannot live a perfect life. So then how can God give us these blessings if we can't obey him perfectly? Well, it's because of the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ. He obeyed perfectly so that he could give us these blessings as a free gift. However, we do need to realize that he encourages us to obey him by requiring that we obey uh, and he withholds the, or, you know, by withholding the blessings until we actually do obey. It's a means to give us incentive. If we trust the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from our sins, we have salvation. We have the whole package. We have the blessings of salvation, uh, forgiveness of sins, the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, a title to heaven. All the blessings belong to us, but the Lord will withhold them from us unless we are walking in the paths of obedience. That's the way we see what God is saying, and that encourages us then to obey, to obey the Lord. Now tonight, we're going to look at another reason why we should love God's law, and it's simply this, because it shows us how to obey. It, it is the, the, the standard, and of course, in showing us how to obey, it shows us how we can gain these blessings. Now, Again, in a church environment where we, we really delve a bit more deeply into God's Word than perhaps you see happening in a number of churches, we might ask ourselves the question, why can't we be like the others? You know, why can't we be like most professing Christians who are satisfied with just a vague idea of what it is that God wants us actually to do? Why can't we just say we're going to love God and love our neighbor and just let it go at that? You know, why can't we just go that direction and not be bothered with all the details that God gives us in his word on how to do this? Well, the answer is because God himself wants to be loved in a very specific way. And he wants us to love others in a very specific way as well. Now, there are so many today, even among professing Christians, who believe that they really are loving God when they're actually doing things that are offensive to Him. And they don't realize it because they haven't actually looked in the Word of God to see what it is that pleases Him. They just think that by wanting to please Him, they're pleasing Him. But God spells it out so that we will do it in a very specific way. In the Old Testament, we find that if his people varied even a little bit from what he told them to do. Sometimes it had some pretty serious consequences. Now, thankfully, we don't see a lot of that happening in the New Testament. And um, I'm thinking of the case of Ananias and Sapphira. It did happen, but they did something fairly significantly wrong. They lied to the Holy Spirit. We may be guilty of doing the same thing. We need to realize that even our sins deserve what Ananias and Sapphira got, but thankfully, by God's grace, he doesn't give that to us. But the point is, God wants us to love him in a particular way. And if he's told us, why wouldn't we want to learn what it is and, and seek to do it? And of course, there's so many today who think that they're loving other people, you know, that, that um, well, they, they want to love other people. And they think that by tolerating what what everybody does and what they choose to do, and you know what I mean by that. There's all these different sexual orientations, and let's just let, you know, treat everybody equally and let everybody do what they want to do in the name of love. Well, in reality, they're not really loving them at all. But according to God's word, they're encouraging them, they're encouraging these others to do things that will ultimately destroy them. Toleration is not helping them. Toleration is going to hurt them. Because there is only one right way to love your neighbor. And there is only one right way to love God. And that is the way that God tells us in his word. So we don't want to refuse or neglect what God tells us. Because if we do that, we're not only going to offend him and lose our opportunity to save our neighbors from their sins, but we're also going to miss out on the blessings that God promises to give us if we will simply obey him and love him and love others the way he wants us to do that. Ignorance in this area is not bliss. Now, the more we know, the better we can do what it is that God wants us to do. And the better we can do it, the better then, of course, our eternity is going to be not only for ourselves, but also for others that we reach out to with the gospel. We need to know what to tell them. And the Lord tells us in his word. He's given us a blueprint 
on how we are to do what we do in a way that is pleasing to him. And so we should see its value. We should love the law. And of course, we should set our hearts to do it. Now this evening, what I would like us to look at from this text are really three things. That you should love God's law, why you should love God's law, and what difference it should make in your life that you love it, what it should move you to do, since you do love it. So first of all, let's consider that you should love God's law. Now, it's certainly plain that the psalmist did. He says, oh, how I love your law. I don't know when the last time is you said that or, or I said that, but this is something we ought to be saying all the time. Now, you realize the writers of Scripture are not given to exaggeration. The psalmist says this is the way he viewed the law. This was what was in his heart. Not that I like your law, God. I'm willing to tolerate it in order that I can get to heaven, even though I really don't like it. But that he loved it. Love is a very strong affection, a very strong inclination of heart towards something in soul. He had a passion for this standard by which God says we should live. Now, how strong was this love? Well, it's so strong, of course, he uses the term love, which is really the strongest affection, I think, that the Lord has given to us, love. But he also explains it in another way that, um, you know, he sort of uh, explains it in terms of a sensation, a taste, as it were, that it produced a, a familiar sensation in his soul that was not unlike what we might experience when we eat something that we really enjoy. I mean, aren't we a society that loves food? I mean, we love to eat food. We love it because it tastes good, you know, and we look around at us, at at all the people in America, and we see that Americans love food, right? We love food, we like to eat it, and we eat a bit too much because we love the sensation, right? (laughs) Well, that's what he said regarding God's law. It's like eating something that tastes really good and something that is is sweet to the taste. He says in verse 103, how sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I mean, is the law of God really sweet? If I were to take a bite out of this section of the Bible, would I taste sweetness? No, he's again talking about a sensation of soul, right? It has a sweetness to my soul like food that I delight in. And he delighted in God's law. It was fulfilling to him. It's like getting something that you've wanted for so long and you haven't quite been able to get it and you finally get it. It brings this, this, this delight to you, this satisfaction. Now, is the psalmist the only person in the Bible who really looked at the law of God in this way? Well, obviously not. Um, A couple of examples from the New Testament, Paul shows his very high regard for the law when he says this, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. You see, he didn't look at it as something terrible, legalism, let's do away with that, but rather as something that he delighted in. And of course, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes into the world according to Psalm 40, verse 8 and Hebrews 10, 7 through 9, he delighted to do the will of God. This is how Jesus felt toward the law. It was also sweet to him, sweet to his taste, sweet to his soul, and he delighted to do it. Now, if that's how Jesus felt about it, how should you feel towards it? You know, we've been looking in the mornings at what it means to know Jesus Christ, what it means that his image is being formed in you. What it means is whatever Jesus experienced is what you should be experiencing as well because His Spirit lives in you and His Spirit is transforming you into His image from the inside out. This is what you should be experiencing in your life as well if you know Jesus Christ because this is what He experienced. You should love the law of God. Now again, why should you love it? I don't want to be too harsh you know, on, the, on the other believers who, who don't believe this. And I understand something of what it is they're experiencing. It's because they think the law is, is a, you know, a, a works, kind of a works system. And if I, if I keep the law of God, then somehow I'm submitting to a works 
form of salvation and I'm destroying the gospel and so forth. And as long as you look at the law that way, you're going to have that attitude towards it. But we need to understand we're not looking at it that way. And that's not how the Lord would have us to look at it. Why should you love God's law? Well, let's consider why, this, why the psalmist loved it and why Paul loved it and why Jesus loved it. Because it showed them how they might love and honor the one they loved most of all, who is, of course, God. And it also showed them how they could love those that God wanted them to love in a way that is really loving, that is, their neighbor as themselves. It gave them understanding, insight, and wisdom on how to do this. That's what the psalmist tells us this evening. In verse 100, I understand more than the aged because I have observed your precepts. From your precepts, verse 104, I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Verse 99, I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. And then verse 98, your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. You know, in, in every other area of useful work that we do in this world, whenever you learn something, it helps you do that work better, right? That's why we go to school, although some of us go to school because we have to go to school. When you're really young, you know, it's the law. You've got to do it, so you're there because you have to do it. But college is optional, and yet many of us want to go to college. Why do we want to go to college? It, so that we can learn how to do something uh, better so that we can benefit from it, so that we can maybe benefit other people uh, you know, by, by doing these things. Because the better you can do what you're going to do, the more you can help others and the more you can help yourself. But you do need to realize doing all those things without the law, it's only going to help you here but not help you hereafter doesn't matter what field of endeavor it is. If you do it devoid of the way God would have you to do it, if you do it you know, without his glory or honor in view, it's not going to profit you at all. But God's law shows you how to do what you do, provided it's not a sinful thing to begin with, and I hope that wouldn't be true of any of us here. But it shows you how to do what you do in a way that gives glory to God so that what you do will be profitable not only here, but also in the life that is coming. See, the law of God can do something and all other learning can't do. It can help you honor the Lord in such a way that it will profit you in the life to come. And the Bible tells us there is a life to come. You know, that we're only here for 80, 90, maybe 100 years. And that's just a blink in eternity. What really matters is what happens after this life. The law of God helps you to profit in the life which is coming. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present and also for the life to come. Now you see, only godliness does. Nothing else does. This is all that really then matters. So when you do what you do to glorify God, when you, when you know how to do it for His glory and you do it for your glory, it not only helps you here to do it better and to benefit more from it here, but you also get to keep it forever when you, you know, what you've done. Now, how can you really put a price on that? You know, the psalmist said in Psalm 19 that his law was more precious than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. How can you put a price on something that is going to benefit you not only in this life because as uh, I think it was um, John Gerser once said, you know, the law of God and obeying the law of God will help you build. If, in, let's say you're living in, in an era where, well, even today we still build mousetraps. Uh, you can build a better mousetrap if you do it for the glory of God. You'll make a better one because you'll want to honor him in it. And it will benefit other people more. Whatever you make, 
whatever you do will benefit other people more because you'll do it better. And as you benefit other people more, it will benefit you more here. But as you do it for the glory of God, it will also benefit you in the world to come. Everything you do in this world apart from the glory of God, everything you might gain is all going to be left behind. All the money that you might make, all the possessions you might have, the relationships that you might develop, the skills that you acquire, even your own body. All of that has to be left behind when you die. But there is a way to take something out of this world, a way to keep something forever. Everything you do for God, everything you give to Him, everything you surrender for Him, everything you do for His glory, you get to take with you when you leave. We know that's true because of what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up your, for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, the law of God shows you how you can store up treasures in heaven, how you can get blessings here, and how you can get rewards there. And that's why you should love the law of God. It helps you to honor the Lord more that you might gain these things. So you should love the law, and you should love it because it shows you how you might gain blessings and rewards. Well, finally then, if that's true, since it is true, what should your love for the law move you to do? Well, again, the same thing the psalmist did. First of all, he meditated on the law. Verse 97, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. We might ask ourselves the question, how often do we meditate on the law of God? Remember this morning we were thinking about the fact that you know, we're tempted all the time. We have to make decisions all the time. And in every decision there's a temptation not to do what's right. Well, how do we know what the right, way, right thing to do is? The law of God tells us. So maybe we are meditating on it a bit more than we thought. Because with every decision we have to make the right choice. And the only way we can know how is according to the law of God. So we need to meditate on it. He says in verse 99, for your testimonies are my meditation. And what it means is he mulled over these things in his mind. He thought about them. He thought about how they applied until he understood more about the law. And again, that's what you need to do. Don't just know what the commandments say in their bare words. You know, the, the Pharisees were, were actually famous for believing themselves to be righteous because they kept the letter of the law. Oh, I, you know, I, I, I haven't broken the, the, you know, the absolute bare meaning of these words. And yet Jesus pointed out to them that the meaning went deeper than just the words themselves, but also it affected your thoughts. You know, it it, it um, told you how you should think and how you should desire and so forth. You might not have murdered your brother, but if you've called him a fool or if you've hated him in your heart, you've already murdered him in your heart, you see. Uh, so we can break the commandments in other ways. You, so don't just know what the commandments say. Don't just memorize the commandments. But study them and meditate on them until you know how they apply. There's no better way than by reading the scriptures and seeing how the Lord applies them across all these different circumstances. Secondly, of course, apply them. Keep them. Notice what the psalmist says in verse 100. I understand more than the aged because I have observed your commandments. I keep them, he says. Now notice that he said he understands more than his elders. His elders would be the ones you know, older than him who have had more time to meditate on the scriptures, more time to live, more time to you know, presumably know more than he did. But he understood more than they did. And why? It's because he kept them, and they didn't. Now, John Frame, who was one of my professors when I was in seminary in his Christian ethics class, did share something I thought would be very, very helpful, and I think I may have shared it before.
But he talked about the relationship between um, application and knowledge. If you, if you really understand something, then you know how to apply it. If you know how to apply something, you really understand it. He would say that knowledge is application. So if you think you know something, but you really don't know how it applies, you really don't understand it. Okay? So you need to learn it. Now, how can you learn it? Well, you try to apply it as much as you possibly can. Because the more you can do that, the better you will understand it. But that's exactly what the psalmist says he was doing. I understand more than the aged because I'm actually applying these commandments to my life. And as I do, I understand more about them. Well, that's what the Lord wants you to do. The more you keep them and the more you put them into practice, the better you will understand them. And of course, the better you understand them, the better you're going to be able to keep them. And the more you're going to gain God's blessings and rewards. And so it's important not only to meditate on them, but it's important that you apply them. By the way, what does the Bible say about knowing that you need to do something, but then you don't do it? You know, that just makes you more culpable. There's no blessing in that. Uh, that's why um, was it, uh, um, Capernaum was going to be more severely punished in the day of judgment than Sodom and Gomorrah because they knew more of what God wanted them to do but didn't do it. And Sodom and Gomorrah may have committed greater sins in the sense that they were breaking the law, but they weren't aware of it. And so Capernaum was more culpable, more blamable because they knew and didn't do. So we need to know and do. And as we do, we will know better. We will understand better what God wants us to do. So meditate on it, apply it. Thirdly, understanding what God wants you to do, fight against the temptation to do the opposite. In other words, fight temptation. Verse 101, I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. That sounds like what Jesus was doing this morning, right? As he faced the enemy. Uh, remember we saw this morning, if you know Jesus... If you are like Jesus, if you want to be more like Jesus, you need to resist every temptation. You need to resist to do the things he tells you not to do. Resist that. It's sin. You need to resist not doing what he tells you to do. And you need to resist going after good things in wrong ways, like we saw in the case of Satan's temptations with Jesus. He kept promising him things that Jesus really came into the world to do to prove he was the Messiah, making the stones into bread, throwing himself off the temple so the angels catch him, uh, gaining uh, uh, dominion over all the kingdoms of the earth. All those were good things. That's what Jesus came to do. But the way in which Satan would have him do it was wrong. You need to resist every evil way and keep God's word. And then finally... If you really love the law of God in this way, you will set your heart on keeping the commandments because you know the law did not come from man, but it came from God, and it came from him for your good. Look at verse 102. I have not turned aside from your ordinances. Why? For you yourself have taught me. When God speaks, it's wise on our part to listen to him. So knowing that the God who made you, the God who redeemed you, the God who says he's going to care for you throughout all eternity calls you to do these things, you're not just going to conveniently set them aside when it suits you. You won't because you will hate the alternative. Remember, he starts off with, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation. He ends with, from your precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. So realizing God gave them to you, that they're good, they're for you, your good, for his honor, for the good of your neighbor, uh, you will do these things and you will hate the contrary way. You will resist every temptation. So if you love God's law because you see in it the blueprint that he has given to you in order to honor him and receive his blessings, then you're going to do certain things. You're going to meditate on it, so that you might know how to apply it, and you will apply it, uh, so that you will understand it more fully. 
and you will fight against every temptation to disobey it. That is what we see Jesus Christ doing, right? He loved his Father. He loved his commandments. Uh, he loved his Father's commandments because he loved him. And so he meditated on those commandments. He kept those commandments. He resisted everything that was contrary to those commandments. If you know the Father and the Son, if you have his Spirit also in you, if Jesus is being formed in you, then this is what you will do as well because that's what the Spirit of God's doing in you. Not perfectly, but consistently. And we might say also with increasing commitment. That's what growth in Christ-likeness is all about. Now, if that isn't true of you, then I would invite you to come to Jesus Christ to give you the grace to do this because he is the only one who can do that. The Lord says, if you're willing to turn from your sins and trust in him, he will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will give you a new heart. He will give you the power to love him and to love your neighbor, to love the law of God. And so if this isn't true of you, trust Jesus and receive the power from him to gain his blessings, to gain his reward, and particularly salvation from your sins, that you might be able to be with the Lord forever in heaven and not have to endure punishment for your sins in hell. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's pray that the Lord would help us to apply this.